morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Let's stand and worship the Lord this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we can come into your house. Just 
worship you in spirit and in truth in your house, Lord God. There is no one like you. No one above you. You are king of all kings. Lord of all lords. Yes, Lord. Your power and your glory and your majesticness is in this house today. The train of your robe fills the temple. Distractions take precedence in hearing God's beautiful voice.
It's a privilege and an honor to be here to worship the Lord and to honor him as we take communion. The communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a sacrament which proclaims his life, his sufferings, his sacrificial death and resurrection and the hope of his coming again that we sang about this morning. It shows forth the Lord's death until his return. In the Church of the Nazarene, we have open communion to all those who are truly repentant, forsaking their sins and believing in Christ for salvation. You are invited to participate in the death and resurrection of Christ. As a body of Christ, we have the privilege to share in the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit. It is important for us to remember what Christ has done for us and to receive communion with hearts full of gratitude. Let us bow our heads right now and pray and ask him to cleanse our hearts and minds and to help us to surrender our lives before him to please him. This prayer is from Psalm 139, 23 and 51. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, Lord. Lead me in the way of everlasting. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Blessed be the God of our salvation who bears our burdens and forgives our sins. Almighty God, to you, all hearts are open, all desire is known, and with you, no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worship you in spirit and in truth. And all of God's people said, Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. May we come before God in true humility and faith as we partake of this holy sacrament. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. We are thankful, Lord. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve you blameless into everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. We are thankful, Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. We understand that this holy sacrament is a reminder of your grace, mercy, and great love for each one of us. Lord, we thank you with grateful hearts this morning for what you have done for us, and we love you. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, amen. It's been a good morning, hasn't it? We could go home right now happy. Let's go. Oh, no. What I'm going to tell you this morning or talk about is something that I know you all know already. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. But sometimes we need to be reminded of what we do know. Because if you're like me, you forget what you knew. Until somebody else said it, says it, says, oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Or sometimes when we hear it said a little differently, it registers a little differently. And this morning, what I have to share with you builds on Chaplain Soso's sermon on letting Jesus deal with our demons, with the stuff that hinders us from uh, serving him. And it builds on Pastor Chris's sermon last Sunday on the Great Commission instructing us to go out and make disciples. Today, I would like to ask the next question that comes. Why do some people lose their passion for God? Or another way of asking this is to wonder what caused people to drop out of an active, passionate devotion to God. Now, until you prove me otherwise, I'm operating on the assumption that each of you are here today because at some level, and I suspect different levels for each one of us, but on some level, we are here because we want to be in that relationship with God. In that relationship that God desires for us. That's why we're here. If not, we'd be home either sleeping or watching TV or Maybe working out in the yard. No, not working in the yard. It's too hot. But you, you, you get what I mean. The, my assumption is you're here because you are looking for what God has for you. Paul writes in First Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, 
I thank God every time I mention you in my prayers. I'm thankful for all of you every time I pray, and it's always full of joy. I'm glad because of the way you've been my partners in the ministry of the gospel from the time you first believed until now. And I'm sure about this, the one who started a good work in you will stay with you to complete the job by the day of Jesus Christ. Now, I read this passage as I was preparing the sermon. It wasn't what I, wasn't in a passage I was working on in developing the sermon. It's one I stumbled across as I was working on the sermon. And I suspect the Holy Spirit had something to do with this because I think this passage is very applicable to, to this church. Applicable to each of you sitting here this morning, for you indeed are partners in ministry. And as I pray for you, I find I identify well with Paul, that I'm thankful for each one of you because you indeed are partners in ministry. You are part of the family of God. Paul. The second thing he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 and 20, don't suppress the spirit. Don't brush off spirit-inspired messages. And I should add that I'm, I'm, the past version I'm reading from is the Common Everyday Bible. Um, I, I, it is a translation. Um, it even had the Church of the Nazarene involved in the, in the translation committee. And I like their wording. But if you try to follow along in NIV or King James or some of those others, you may have trouble following me, so um, enjoy me enjoying it. Uh, though Paul is writing this passage to a different group of people than in the letter to the Philippians, it too is applicable to us. Because have you ever wondered why people who at one time were passionate followers of Jesus lost their passion? What makes it possible for someone in an intimate relationship with God to lose that intimacy, to lose that connection. Though perhaps not the only reason, I think a major contributor to one's loss of intimacy, of one's connection with God, has a lot to do with our own attitudes. In other words, it's not God who withdraws or walks away from us. Rather, it's us and our attitudes that create blocks to keep God from being intimate with us. These two passages could just as easily have been written for the Las Vegas Church of the Nazarene instead of the churches to Philippi and Thessalonica. And this morning, I'd like for us to take a look at some of the attitudes we can take on that will move us from praise of thanksgiving to a position of conflict with God. And the Bible speaks of four negative attitudes one can take towards God's Holy Spirit that leads us to a resultant loss of intimacy, a loss of closeness, a loss of confidence in God. And I want to understand it's not that God walked away from us. It's that we've shifted away from God. And the first we find in Ephesians 4.30. In the NIV it reads, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The common English or everyday Bible, puts it this way, don't make the Holy Spirit unhappy. Ooh, I like that. Don't make the Holy Spirit unhappy. And did it ever cross your mind that we were capable of making God unhappy? Oh, we know we read in the Bible angry, but unhappy? And that emphasizes the personal connection God has with us. The character of our relationship with God is a personal one. And as such, it's possible for us to hurt the Holy Spirit. And you know, we've done in this past year a lot of grieving. And grief has occurred when somebody significant to us has passed on, has died. And we've grieved loss of jobs. We've grieved loss of ability to worship the way we have become accustomed to. But grieving always signifies that it's over something that is important to us. None of us that I'm aware of 
has grieved over people that we did not know. The numbers may bother us, but we don't grieve over the people because there's no personal connection. And that's not wrong. That's the way God made us. But for God to grieve over what we do indicates that God has a strong, personal, intimate relation with us to start with, or we wouldn't be able to grieve him. The word grief indicates a tender, intimate, loving relationship. The elephant in the evangelical world today is a question of whether one must endorse a particular political position in order to be a biblical Christian. You know, I kind of strongly believe that that attitude makes God sad, especially when it causes division within families, within churches, within culture. Shirley and I were talking that looking at the division in our country Looking historically, we have to go back to the Civil War to find a time when the country was as divided as it is now. And interestingly, at the point of the Civil War, both the North and the South had great theological leaders who had tremendous biblical support for their position, which was in a complete opposite to each other. You had good Bible-believing people came to wrong conclusions during the Civil War. And I can't help but wonder with the divisions and the anger that I'm seeing today, if we haven't done the same thing that we have good, Bible-believing Christians on both sides. And yet, if we aren't one or the other, we're not Christian? I don't think God sees it quite way, that way. Paul... To paraphrase him, he said that we're neither Jew nor Gentile, male, female. I think today Paul would say we're neither Republican or Democrat. We're other. We're human. We're Christian. We may be Republican or Democrat and be a Christian, but we don't have to be one or the other to be a Christian. And we can be very passionate, but it can't override our commitment for Jesus first. You know, I don't find any biblical support for putting my own personal finances, my own personal power ahead of others in need. Jesus gave us the example of the Good Samaritan when asked, who's my neighbor? And I think the answer was expected, well, those close to you, your family, those within your synagogue. And he said, ah, it's the Samaritan. And looking at the history, who were the Samaritans? They were at the most conflict with the, the, the Jewish nation at the time, theologically, politically, so much so that a good Jew would not walk from the southern part of Israel to the northern part going through Samaria. They'd walk around, adding miles to their trip. And Jesus says, that's your neighbor." My neighbor is not just like me. My neighbor is everybody. So two questions arise out of this. Are you in an intimate relationship with God? And secondly, if so, are you doing anything that would make God sad? The second attitude we find in Paul's letter to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. It says in the NIV, don't quench the spirit. In the common everyday Bible, it says, don't suppress the spirit. Dennis Kinlaw wrote in This Day with the Master that a fire is quenched by pouring water on it. In other words, Paul's telling us not to put God's fire out in our lives. That fire has come into our lives, our souls, when we were filled with the Holy Spirit. And there comes a passionate burning to know Christ. And we've heard Lynn's testimony, and it's a tremendous one, of finding God and wanting to just devour the Bible. And it's a passion that still consumes Lynn. That's what Dennis Kinlaw and this passage is talking about, that we become passionate for God. 
And Paul's warning us here that it's possible for us to put that fire out, to contain it so that where there was once warmth and light, there's now only coolness and death. Water puts out fire when it's poured on the fire. And sin, disobedience to God, is the water, air quotes, in our lives that grieves the Spirit and puts out the Spirit's flame. So I ask you this morning, whether your life is white hot with fire of the Spirit, or are you in the process of letting the Spirit be quenched, to be put out, or has it already been put out? Have you allowed choices to counter the known will of God, to douse your fire for God? Maybe even replacing the fire for God, that passion, with a political passion. Just asking. I would suggest, again, that there's not just us and them, but rather there's a third def- designation much more biblical. And I picked this up from a pastor in the Point Loma area, Nazarene pastor, who says, we're neither us nor them. We aren't one or the other. We're Christian. We're, that is all we are. The other is just reflects who we are as Christians, but Christianity is the third category, and it trumps all the others. We are indeed much more alike then we are different. So Paul, I think, is saying let's focus on unity rather than division. A third negative attitude is summed up in the statement that we find in Acts 7.51. Do not resist the Spirit. And Acts, the passage reads, you stubborn people, in your thoughts and hearing, you are like those who have no part in God's covenant. You continually set yourself against the Holy Spirit, just like your ancestors did. Now, to put this in context, Stephen is speaking just before the Sanhedrin stones him to death, and he is telling them that these spiritual leaders of Israel have worked actively against God's covenant. He told them they had uncircumcised hearts or unbaptized hearts. Now, the Pharisees would have been baptized in a ritual bath of purification, but the ceremony was simply the symbol without the reality. A paraphrase of Stephen would be, boy, you're careful what you look like, how people perceive you, but you don't have the reality of what you're putting on. You're deaf to God's message and empty of his spirit. You know, our relationship with God can, as believers can move rapidly from a close, intimate relationship to a relationship in which the love has been extinguished, and finally to one of full opposition and resistance while maintaining that we are indeed following him. And like Pharisees, we as fallible human beings are very good at rationalizing our choices as actually being defensive and supportive of God, just as the Pharisees did. They had their Bible down cold. In fact, if you look at the the training of the Pharisees, their biblical training far exceeded anything most of the rest of us have ever had. They knew their Bible. And they did this with good intent. They learned out of the exile that you don't break God's law. So how do you keep people from breaking God's law? Well, you build fences in front of the law, like roadblocks, barricades. So maybe you get through one or two barricades, but you stay away from hitting God's uh, law. Except they put so many of them, it came almost full soak around that the, the regulations they put up actually were... Uh, counterproductive to um, actually fulfilling God's law. When I was in Israel, one of the things that really popped out as we were driving past a small village, uh, our tour guide pointed out to, to uh, the 
town and said, you see the poles with the wires going around the town? Do you know what those wires are? And of course, we all said, well, telephone lines. He said, no. Those are a, the distance marker for how far you can walk on the Sabbath before you become working. And it isn't just enough to have poles periodically so you kind of look to see, yeah, I'm kind of there. It's directly above you. One foot over is too much. They got so caught up in trying to avoid God's law, they created so much burden on people that they actually were causing the law to be broken. And they were good at defending it. You know, I think we get just as good sometimes as defending our own passions and putting biblical nomenclature around what we want. And, and praying, even praying God to bless what we're doing when what we're doing is just what the Pharisees did, justifying our own wants in ways that block what God has intended. Resisting the Holy Spirit. And that happens unless we repent. The fourth negative attitude is summed up in Hebrews 10, 28, 29, which is don't insult the Spirit. And the passage reads, when someone rejected the law from Moses, they were put to death without mercy on the basis of the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think is deserved by the person who walks all over God's Son, who acts as if the blood of the covenant made us holy is just ordinary blood, who insults the Spirit of grace? The writer of the Hebrews is writing about people who once knew the truth and then decided to disobey. Maybe deliberately, maybe just slid into it. But they were doing their own thing instead of God's thing. And the writer indicated that those who disobeyed the law of Moses were put to death and judged guilty on the basis of the testimony of a couple of witnesses. How much more will we be held accountable for treating God's grace of covenant wrong. The one who rejects God's covenant insults the Spirit of God. So how can we be sure we never insult the Spirit? Well, we know what the Pharisees did. They had their fencing law. The idea is somewhat sound, but when you take it to extremes, it doesn't work. For us, it's way too easy to put our own privileges and passions and desires before those of God. In other words, we tend sometimes to place ourselves in a higher priority than we place God. So we need to focus our attention on not how far we can go before we break God's law, but rather focus on how we can do things that won't make God sad. How do we do things that make God happy? If we never resist him, we won't insult him. If we don't grieve his spirit, we will live in a personal, vital, loving, believing relationship with him that will make our lives full, full of his blessings, of his joy, of his peace, and his fruitfulness. Now, this morning we looked at four negative attitudes that lead us away from God. Don't grieve the spirit. Don't quench the spirit. Don't resist the spirit. Don't insult the Spirit. So this morning, it's a good opportunity to do a self-check on our attitudes towards God. Because these attitudes are really easy to slip into if we aren't watching for them. Our attitudes may be keeping us from a relationship with God that Paul identifies as co-workers. You know, and Peggy prayed this morning for revival. And she was praying, I couldn't help but wonder, are our attitudes, not just within this church, but within Protestant Christianity particularly, particularly evangelical Christianity, keeping God from having a massive revival in Las Vegas? Are our attitudes hindering what God would do in this town? Have our attitudes brought God sadness? 
If so, now's the time to discard those negative attitudes. Now's the time for God's passionate fire to burn through us, igniting and lighting the world around us. Today is a good day to indeed check our attitudes. Are we looking for more of Jesus? Are we looking for more of God? Or are we looking, as the Israelites did, for a political leader, for a king to lead us? It appeared that God was sad that the Israelites asked for a king. And I can't help but believe that today he's sad when we look to a political leader instead of him to lead us. Let's be honest with ourselves. Let's pray. Father, search our hearts. You know we love you, Father. But Father, sometimes we let ourselves get in the way. Forgive us when we grieve you, when we make you sad, when we work against you, sometimes even without deliberately choosing so, just by a lack of double-checking ourselves with you. Father, Vicki prayed today that we would search our souls for anything that was displeasing to you. Father, I would pray the same thing, that you would search us, that you would illuminate our minds and our attitudes. Father, show us our blind spots where we don't realize that maybe we are offensive to you. For Father, as we started, I truly believe everyone is here with the desire to be on fire and passionate for you. So Father, guide us, lead us. We ask these things in your name. Amen. And today, our benediction I've selected out of 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, where Paul says, put things in order, respond to my encouragement, be in harmony with each other and live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Say hello to each other. Paul said that. Go in peace. Shalom. Shalom.